There are more than 50 bills being worked on by the House of Representatives to combat the opioid crisis. And the Senate has its own list of bills as well. While Congress tries to help the crisis with new legislation, the epidemic isn't getting better. This week here on TDA, we're taking a closer look at the crisis and how we as a country can tackle it. So will the government eventually treat opioids like big tobacco? It was once the example in terms of success and influence in the U.S. Yeah, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing someone smoking in a magazine, on a bus stop, or just feet away from you. I looked into how the industry started to die a slow death when the government turned its back on the once billion dollar powerhouse. Whether you've realized it or not, some of your favorite characters all had a nasty habit. I decided to get a grip on my life and start a diary. Starting in the 1920s, cigarettes were a hot trend, and over the years it became a lifestyle for people like Bridget Jones. Cigarettes weren't only in parks and homes, but on TV commercials and in the White House. In 1924, Time Magazine says more than 73 billion cigarettes were sold. By the 1960s, the tobacco industry was making billions of dollars. But at some point after that, there was a shift. In 1964, the U.S. Surgeon General released its first report explaining how smoking causes lung cancer. Big tobacco slowly began losing credibility, but it didn't go up in smoke overnight. Two years later, seven of the 100 top advertisers in the country were tobacco companies, and they weren't going to take backlash lying down. Big Tobacco relied on the idea that the science behind how harmful tobacco could be was uncertain. 360. New tax on a new warning. Oh, Christ. By 1965, Congress required all cigarette packages carry a warning label. Five years later, TV and radio ads were done. And by 1998, smoking was banned on all carrier flights. But the most ironic turn was that same year when the Marlboro Man got cancer and jumped ship. He started working on anti-smoking campaigns. You don't know we die from tobacco. Sometimes you just lose a love. Now the FDA regulates all tobacco products and says recent legislation makes way for action against future tobacco products too. It's safe to say between Marlboro Man and now, Big Tobacco lost a lot of support. And in 1994, it only got worse. Tobacco hotshots took the stand before the House of Representatives and the entire country. Yes or no, do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. And they lied. They went against science and the new status quo that smoking wasn't healthy. They lost some of their biggest advocates. In 1998, tobacco companies made history, but for all of the wrong reasons. It agreed to what the Tobacco Control Legal Consortium calls the biggest civil litigation settlement in U.S. history. Hundreds of billions of dollars went to 46 states for a Medicaid lawsuit. PBS reported the suit was on behalf of taxpayers who had to cover the Medicaid costs to treat sick smokers. And Big Tobacco is still paying up and will be for a long, long time. And you talk about a long time. States are still getting checks from this very lawsuit today. One source saying payments will be made for an indefinite amount of time. Now, could opioid manufacturers and distributors get the same treatment Big Tobacco saw in the 90s? That's exactly why I spoke with Keith Humphreys. He's a former White House Office National Drug Control Policy Advisor and a professor of psychiatry at Stanford. He says the fat check and more regulation are on the way. How could those big lawsuits in the 90s that kind of took down Big Tobacco companies, how could that shape how we approach opioid manufacturers and distributors today? So in both cases, what we have is an industry that really pushed the boundaries of regulation, did a lot in pursuit of profit that caused a huge amount of damage to public health. So in the tobacco uh, settlement, there was a lot of money that was paid to the public, but more importantly, there were constraints placed on the industry from that point forward. So the most important thing to look for in this case is not just will there be a big check written, which there will be, but can we stop the industry, for example, from marketing in dishonest ways, telling doctors pills are more safe than they actually are, and stop distributors from shipping to little towns where there's far more supply than you could ever possibly justify rationally? Right. Well, so right now there's more than 40 states that have subpoenaed opioid manufacturers. So. Is there, is there strength in numbers when it comes to that, uh, when, when it comes to the states, or, or should there be a more federal response? Well, you know, it, 
it's probably the case that um, the best way to settle this is to roll it all into one. And that's and it seems to be what the, the bias of the courts is. And it's probably a, a good solution because we don't want some states to get a great deal and then other states to get nothing, of course. Uh, which is which can always happen. Right. Um, and particularly some of the states that have been hardest hit are actually lower income states that might have less money to fund their attorney general to make these suits and so on. We're so talking about Ohio, it, Kentucky, the, these types of areas. West Virginia, which is where I'm from. Of yeah. course. So, yeah, tying everybody together, I think, makes a lot of sense. Uh, and also then we can get a national solution to things like inappropriate marketing and uh, irresponsible corporate behavior. So what does this mean for the people affected? I mean, how, how does this, you know, take it back to Main Street? Well, well, sadly, you know, the people who have suffered and, and died up to this point, there's really nothing we can do about it. I mean, it's horrible, but um, there's no way to, you know, put the toothpaste back in the tube. But what we can do is stop a next generation of people from suffering the same way. If we can get back to the very sensible way we prescribed opioids in this country for a very long time, when we certainly use them because they are very good medications, but we restrict them to cancer and serious pain and terminal illness and short term after surgery, we can have a country where people do get pain relief, but we don't have this epidemic of addiction. And if that came out of this case, that would be a very good outcome, bigger than any check would be just getting us back to that sensible way of using these medications. Do you foresee, I mean, not that there isn't public outcry now, but do you foresee more of that public push with advertising, uh, similar to how we see these anti-tobacco campaigns? Do you foresee that maybe in our future? You know, I'd like to think that we can put some pretty significant constraints on these companies. I'm also aware, though, that unlike with tobacco, they are selling a legal product that was approved by the Food and Drug Administration. So they may might argue in court, I would if I were them, well, look, you know, how can the government stop us from advertising this when they've already said these are safe? So that's going to be a tough thing to negotiate. But if we could get to that point, I think we would be much better off. I mean, doctors do need good information, but they should get that from, you know, scientific journals, from their colleagues, from continuing education. And in my opinion, not from, you know, people who work for the companies and come to the offices and, you know, give out a lot of gifts and seem very smooth and clever and all that. But don't fundamentally have public health as their goal. Their goal is to sell product. Yes, yeah, Keith said there's no way to put the toothpaste back in the tube. It's out. We can't deny the problem anymore as a country. And he thinks it's about the return to prescribing opioids sensibly. Which, as he pointed out, is something that we did as a country for a while.